In this session, we're going to be talking about the overcoming believers' glorification. Why this is important in the study of Revelation is because it directly affects those who will be ruling and reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ in the coming messianic kingdom. Um, we have been studying the glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ in all three aspects. So we're now beginning that journey into understanding the believer's glorification and what does that mean? Uh, and we just start off with this simple little statement and that is overcoming for glorification, don't miss it for the world. It has a double meaning, doesn't it? Because what happens is when believers get involved in the world, they will miss their overcoming. And when they miss the overcoming, they're going to miss glorification. Now, this is something where we're going to be clarifying and working on something that's a little different. Open your Bibles today to Revelation 21, verse 7. Revelation 21 and verse 7. And I invite you to come on this journey of understanding with me. This is critical because every one of us who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ for his promise of eternal life is going to be standing at the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us. Uh, what happens at that time will determine what happens in the future for you. Now, remember, that has nothing to do with heaven and hell, but it has everything to do with your position and opportunities that will be afforded to you in the coming kingdom. That's why in Revelation 21 and verse 7, listen to the Lord Jesus Christ as he's speaking. Some of the, not his very last words, but close, where it says this, um, he who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Now, there's some very special things there. One, inherit these things. Those are the things dealing with not only the millennial kingdom, but the right to be an inheritor within the eternal new heaven and the earth. The inheritor is the one that will possess the kingdom, the one who will ultimately serve with Christ. We'll look at some of those things briefly. But also it says, uh, I will be his God and he will be my son. Obviously, every believer, he is our God. So this is, this is a reward aspect. And it's speaking of an intimacy with God that will not be known by those who are not inheritors of the kingdom, those who are not the overcomers. This is not a promise to every believer. They also says he will be my son. That's the mature son. The mature sons, as we have studied in the past, are those who will be the inheritors of the kingdom, those who will be the partners of Christ, the mature sons who will have that very special position in the coming kingdom. The word overcomer, nikaao, simply means victory. You, if you have a, a pair of sneakers called Nikes, that's what it means, victory. A victory over hostile powers. Now, the word is used some 17 times in the book of Revelation alone. So it's critically, critically important. The word overcomer means to carry the victory, come off victorious. The verb implies a battle. Well, where does that happen? This is the time of battle. This is the time of spiritual warfare. This is the time when we are engaged with the enemy. The enemy, of course, is the world of flesh, the devil. We'll mention that again in a little bit. But we're, when we come off the field of battle, means when we go home through death or rapture, do we come off the field victorious or not? The overcomer is the one who obviously has conquered something or someone. Well, what is being conquered? Go with me to the book of First John. First John chapter two. <clears throat> this is all the introduction to the believer's glorification, but we got to lay the groundwork. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If the anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Verse 17, the world is passing away 
and also its lusts, its desires, its temptations, if you will. The one who does the will of God lives forever or abides forever. Now listen to me, that living and abiding forever, that does it, is not a guarantee of you're going to have eternal life because it is warning a believer, don't get involved in the things of the world. If a believer gets involved in the things of the world, you don't lose your phase one eternal life. So what this is speaking of is a fullness of life. Listen to me, a fullness of life. It's of the closeness of fellowship, being with Christ. I will be his God and he will be my son. There it is, the one who does the will of God. Now that word world there is cosmos. It simply means the satanic cosmic system. That's the world in which you live. It talks about the lust there. That has the, the lust of the sin nature. And if you go over to chapter five, and verse 19, chapter five and verse 19, are you there? Okay, turn in your Bibles, look at your scriptures, please. I can't hardly stand it when people sit there and just stare at me. You cannot read scripture off my face. All right, I wanna hear pages turn or something. All right, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The whole world, the satanic cosmic system, the world in which you live is run by, managed by Satan himself. We learned that in the angelic conflict. So overcomers are not perfect people. Don't get that idea. I'm not good enough to overcome. When you say that, what you're saying is the God who indwells you is not powerful enough and almighty enough to provide you the source power that you need through his spirit and his word for you to be an overcomer. When you say, I cannot be an overcomer, I cannot stop this desire that I have, for example. I, it, I, the lust of the flesh, whether it's my whatever it is, or the trends of my sin nature, I cannot overcome them. Listen to me, that says more about what you believe about God than what it does about you. If he is powerful enough to create the universe, don't you think he can handle your desires? Well, it's all a matter of how we respond and what do we do in response to it. They're not, but they're not perfect. But they will have as their desire and their goal, which then will translate into action to live in fellowship with him. First John is all about fellowship. And to follow his word in daily living. When they fail, what do we do? First John 1 9. When we fail, what do we do? We fess up. We, we, after our, when we mess up, we fess up, we get up and go. It's as simple as that. We confess, we choose to go God's way instead of our way. Now, that is often the pattern of many people's spiritual life. You're making progress with some ups and downs, and a lot of times, oh, you have a real backwards event that happens, or a series of events over time where you made a good start, but then... But you know what? You're still headed for the right goal. That's called progressive sanctification. It is leading to a fullness of glorification. Now you hang on to that because that is a critical thing, a fullness of glorification. It is where we will share in the glory of God himself, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We will share in that. His, the, the glory that he obtained in his manhood is what we will share. So overcomers are not superheroes. They're just ordinary believers who learn to choose God's way. But let's face reality. We all fall sometimes. <laughs> Isn't that just great? How many of you have felt that way more than once in your spiritual life? Remember, Christ is the pattern. Revelation Chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. 21. Listen. Revelation 3.21. Are you there? Revelation 3.21. He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. Now look. Just as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. When was he the overcomer? When he was in his humanity in this world. Remember, in his humanity, he set the pattern for how we are to live. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Come on, stay with me. 
Hebrews chapter 12. These verses are familiar to you. Verse 1, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 11, surrounding us, the Lord Jesus Christ also, uh, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Stop. The encumbrance are things that in and of themselves are good things, but they interfere with your forward progress. For example, it, it is not a bad thing to want to spend time with family. However, it becomes an encumbrance on your spiritual life when you keep missing Bible class in order to be with family. Right. And the sin which so easily besets us, what is that? That's the lust patterns of our own self, okay? Mm -hmm. Which so easily entangles us. That idea of entangling is if you're out there running a race and you, you hit a, 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 a briar patch and those things get wrapped around your ankles, you're going to be like those guys that we saw stumbling just a little bit ago. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. What is the race that is set before us? Ultimately, is for you to be glorified with the Lord Jesus Christ, to be approved at the judgment seat of Christ. So how do you handle that? Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Why? Because he was the overcomer, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We just saw that in Revelation 3. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Listen, just because people do not support you in your spiritual life is no excuse. Even if they oppose you, that's no excuse. And I've said it many times before, but it's so critically important because people will say, well, if you were in my circumstance, you had this, you might, you'd do the same thing. That might be that we'd both be wrong. Because either he's God or he's not. Either the word is true or it's not. And it is true. That's why it says in 1 Peter 2.21 on the screen, for you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. That is discipleship. That is following the leader right here. Keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of the faith, who, who uh, for the joy set before him endured the cross, the author and perfecter. He was one that initiates the faith that we have in Christ Jesus for eternal life, but it's also the one who helps us achieve the goal. That's what the word perfecter. What are the overcomers? They're going to inherit the kingdom. They're going to reign with Christ as his partners. These are things we should be familiar with around here. He will, they will be kingly priests who will serve with him. They'll have an intimacy of fellowship with him as the bride of Christ. We have yet to study that out. They will live in the new Jerusalem. That's coming. And they will shine like stars because they're glorified. Wait a minute, preacher. Are you talking about the shining? I saw that movie. <laughs> No, I'm not talking about the shine. But you're going to discover this as we go. He's given us the spirit of God, the word of God. He's placed us in the church of God, as well as assigning angels to aid us become overcomers. Did you know that? Hebrews 1.14. He's assigned angels to help you be an overcomer. So... We've been learning of the glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we have to begin to do the comparison between him and us. He is the forerunner. He has set the pattern. The results that happen in his life are the same similar results that can happen in our lives when we get home. He set the pattern for time. He's also set the pattern for what is coming if we're the overcomers. Now today, the best I can do is just give you a little bird seed and throw it out there because we're all not going to be able to do it. You see the angry bird because he only got one seed. So <laughs> we're going to throw some bird seed out here today, but go with me to the book of Colossians because this is an in-depth study. I appreciate Westside that you are not afraid of those things. Uh, we will not, you know, we're not going to spend great amounts of time. In other words, we're not going to spend a year studying this. Uh, we're not even going to spend six months studying this. But we'll knock it out in two or three lessons, I hope. <laughs> you know, 20 years I've been here and it hasn't gotten any better, has it? 
I tell you what, I didn't have any gray hair when I got here. Look at me now. I like what Marcia says in response. I didn't have any gray hair when you got here either. Look at me. All right, listen. Colossians 1, 27. And we'll be coming back to many of these as we go along. To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians chapter one. <laughs> Hey, I've got a new toy. If anybody wants to fall asleep? Open your Bibles. Colossians 1, 27. Some of you just decided you had to go to the potty, didn't you? All right. Verse 28. Listen to me. We proclaim him admonishing. If this is the pastoral mandate, by the way, of the scripture. When, he's, when I sign my name on your emails, this is the passage you see. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. The word complete, having achieved the goal. The goal is not a guarantee. For this purpose, that's why he says, for this purpose, to help present you complete as to meet your goal, I saw I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Now, go back up to the hope of glory. That means the realization of glory. To be complete in Christ is a full glorification where you are sharing his glory. I'll put this on the screen for you. Christ gives us the capacity to become like him in our character in time so that we can have the confident expectation of being like him and sharing his glory. The shared glory, however, is not guaranteed. If it was guaranteed, he would not be saying, we proclaim this, we admonish this with the goal to present you complete. It's not automatic. It is something which is, he said, I have, I have, I have to labor at this. And that is intense, hard labor in the original. He's striving according to his power to bring you to this place. Do you wonder why sometimes when, a, if a pastor loves you, like I love you, why I will do everything I can to harass you, to encourage you, to pray for you, to throw tennis balls at you and to blow horns. Whatever I got to do. Why? Because I want to stand there and to see you and you and you complete, having finished the course in time, become like Christ and you're sharing his glorification. Romans 8, 17. Romans 8, 17. Oh my. Romans 8, 17 says, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God. Every believer is an heir of God. And fellow heirs with Christ, joint heirs with Christ, co-heirs with Christ. If, if, now that word if is the first class condition, condition which simply says, from the standpoint of the speaker, we'll assume this to be true about you, but it is not a guarantee. If indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Now, many times we have talked about this passage, but we're going to expand on what that word glorification means. We'll get into it as we go along. But the word glory, kebab, the Hebrew, doxa, Hebrew, doxa, and the Greek. We've said this before, but I have to keep repeating it. What does that mean to, to share his glory, to be glorified with him? It constitutes, glory constitutes something that is distinctively excellent about the subject. It is something which radiates from the one who has it. Now, this is both character as well as a type of literal radiating light. It is allowing something to be seen 
in a positive way about God. For example, we can glorify God when through our lives, through our worship, through the music, through our personal Bible study, we help others to see something about who God is or what he's done. But it applies also toward our being glorified together with him, that there were things that are positive and God's evaluation about us will be seen. Thus, it brings honor to the subject. And the, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we'll look at this, wants to honor you at the judgment seat of Christ. That's pretty remarkable. It's as individual and personal as your fingerprints. Now, part of that manifestation of glory then is a light that radiates from the one who's glorified. And I'll show you that. But Daniel 12 talks about those that lead many to righteousness shall shine like the stars. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 is going to say star differs from star in glory. So is the resurrection from the dead. Not all believers are going to shine equally, but those who are the, are the overcomers, not all overcomers are going to shine equally, but all overcomers will shine. And we're going to take you through and I'll go ahead and give you this bird seed. It is those who will rule and reign with Christ and live in the heavenly Jerusalem. It is those who will be sharing the power of Jesus himself in ruling the universe. Romans 8, 17, suffering with him leads to being glorified with him. Notice it's not a gift. It's a earned reward. It is merited. It's something one must, must through an evaluation, be counted as worthy to receive it. When is the evaluation? The Bema Seat of Christ. We're going to learn what all this glorified with him means. 2 Corinthians 4, 17. 2 Corinthians 4, 17. We were studying this passage and dealing with suffering just recently. We're going to focus in on 417. Because we mentioned this and we're going to be expounding on it. Again, this is the bird seed day, but we'll be expounding on it just a little bit today. He says this, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparisons. Now notice that in the previous verse, he talks about our inner man being renewed day by day. That's not automatic. But when that inner man is renewed day by day, you begin to see things from the standpoint of eternity. Are you with me? That's why it talks about an eternal weight of glory. Rewards are eternal. But it says it's producing for us an eternal weight of glory. Ketragesimai is the word producing. It means to work something out. It means to bring something about, to accomplish something, to carry out a task until it was finished. Remember the goal of the pastor is to help bring you to that place of being approved at the judgment seat of Christ, of being completely mature so that you can achieve that, you can have that. Well, this is this says that the suffering, listen, the suffering that you're going through is God working to accomplish something in your life. And it is, he literally is working it down toward the end point so that the struggles and pressures that you feel have a goal. That goal is the eternal weight of glory. Now, I have to give you a little bit of grammar here because it's important. In the Greek language, you always have things that's called, it's called, it's called the tense, mood, and voice. Tense, mood, and voice. This particular word is in the present tense, indicative mood, middle voice. Here's what, okay, let me just fill you in real quick. Tense, present. In other words, this is what is happening right now in your life. It's ongoing right now with whatever struggles or suffering you're going through. This is God's working this out. Mood, it's indicative, meaning it is real. It indicates, if you will, it is real. It's certain. It's an objective fact. God did not wake up one day and see 
the problems you're in and say, oh, hey, hey what happened to him? I sure didn't see that one coming. <laughs> right? So God is using those things. And then the voice is the middle voice. Now, this is where it becomes very important. It means the receiver participates in the action and its results. So for the outcome that the Lord desires for your life requires your participation in the process to maintain the right attitude, specifically to look at the eternal reward called the weight of glory. It is earned. It is not a gift. And look what it says. It is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. Now, often in scripture, usually in scripture, that word borrows weight. It means something that's burdensome. It's weight in reference to the pressure, the burden, the load. Is that what that means there? Because no, there it is used in contrast to light. Here it means a fullness or an abundance or a greatness of glory. It's an eternal reward of a fullness or abundance of glory. That's what he's saying. So what is the comparison? He says, the light affliction, that, uh, that word affliction, philipsis, it means that internal pressure that comes from the problems that you may be experiencing in life. Physical, relational, financial, whatever it is. You can think of a hundred different ways. <laughs> James talks about the variegated ways. All the pressure from a variety of different things. It's the ellipsis. It's intense pressure. That's what he's saying. Affliction is an intense pressure. But he uses it with the word light. It ain't heavy when in comparison to the weight of glory. That's the thing. How do you get through the going through? Always remember. That's why he says, far beyond all pleasure. Hupobole, English hyperbole. Hupobole means beyond all comparison. The struggles that you and I go through have an intense, no matter how intense they are, I don't care if it's really, I don't care if people like you or not, ex, don't accept you, attack you, your own family, your own family is one of Satan's favorite places to attack you. Praise God for believing families that help support one another. But that's not always true. But no matter what it is that is going on, he's saying that intense pressure in comparison to the glorification aspect, that fullness of glory. You can't even compare the two for the weight of glory. It's like somebody trying, you know, working out with just the little light weights. Not that I do that a lot, but <laughs> a lot. No, correction, none. But now try and do that with the big weights. Different ball game. Probably very few of us in here could lift 500 pounds. Okay, 300. 300, you're going, 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 going. What's down to 200? We're up to 200. Anybody want to give me 100? Oh, oh, give me 100 pounds. You can lift 100 pounds. Hey, let me see your hands right now. There's 100 pounds sold. Okay, now. What is he saying? He's saying that everything going on in your life, when the doctor says this about you, when your family says that about you, in comparison to what that is working out in your life, it is little. Do you believe God? As that whole thing is the whole thing of glory. All three aspects that we looked at in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ, his glorified body, his glorification with honor, and as glory as the king priest in the coming kingdom, that glorification, that weight of glory for you and I includes all three. So the outcome that the Lord desires is your fullness of glory. How much he loves you. 
You know how easy it is we're in the middle of turmoil to doubt the love of God? You been there? But the word says the opposite is true. So what is that fullness of glory? We're going to have to investigate. But look, go with me real quick over to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. Look at the goal here. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 27. Now, we're not preaching on marriage today. We're going to see what he has to say about you and I. Verse 25 of Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives, just as in the same way Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That giving up was everything from his leaving glory to come in here to this world, to his sacrifice, to I mean, and the life he lived, rejected, hated, ultimately everybody abandoning him, crucifying, resurrection, the people didn't believe in the resurrection, all that stuff, ascension back into heaven, his own nation never yet accepting him. Gave himself up for her, the church. Here's what's called a Hannah clause. That is so that, or for the purpose of, to the end that, this is a goal, that he might sanctify her and cleanse her by the washing of water with the word. That's the majority text reading. Sanctify. Sanctify means to be more and more set apart for the Lord. Remember that progressive arrow we had? The trend should be upwards. Ups and downs, the trend is upwards. To maturity that leads to approval. Might sanctify her by the means of the word. That's why this becomes everything. I can't tell you the number of believers that think somehow or another they can live the Christian life without this. They can live the Christian life without being present in Bible class. Look at the goal, 27. That, there's another purpose. That he might present to himself the church. Who's the church? Raise your hand. Some of you need to get saved today. If you're the church, raise your hand. All right. Well, it's hard to, you know, hard to get the crowd to move sometimes. That he might present to himself the church, you and I. Listen, in all her glory, a fully glorious church, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that, that's the, that's the goal, that's the, the end point, she would be holy and blameless. Wow. A church fully glorified. It's speaking of the church corporately, but it's made up of you and I, the individuals. That, that's the judgment seat of Christ. You know what he wants to see you when you stand there? As part of that fully glorified church and all that that's going to mean. What a day that will be. Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 7. Look at this. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Phase 1, salvation. Something else that happened in the spiritual realm and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That is positional. In other words, that reward of sitting with him has already been set aside for you, and spiritually, it's your spot. Hear me now, but it's not guaranteed. That's right. But what is his purpose? Look what he says. Look at this. So that in the ages to come, for the ages to come, that's all the way through eternity to the angels, to all of those who are going to be born in the millennial kingdom, all of those who will be born throughout eternity, which I firmly believe. So the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That display, it's a goal, it's a potential. 
In order to achieve that goal, what do you have to have? Look at verse eight. It says, for by grace you've been saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. No one will be approved by God who hasn't received Jesus Christ, who hasn't believed in him. I should use a different term there. Have believed in him for eternal life. Not as a result of works that no one will boast. You can't get faith one eternal salvation except by believing. You can't earn it. However, verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so we would walk in them. That's the choice. He has prepared them. That is how we achieve chapter 5, verses 26 and 27. Now look at this, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Go with me. We're almost done for today, unfortunately. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at this. 13 through 15. Second Thessalonians 2, 13 through 15. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you, that is for his own self and his interest from the beginning for salvation through sanctification. Does that have anything to do with phase one salvation? So what is he talking about? Soul salvation. He's talking about sanctification, that being set apart more and more for Christ by the spirit and faith and truth. It was for this he called you through the gospel. Remember, the gospel is good news, including the good news of rewards, that you may oh, gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Gain, that word gain means to obtain, to purchase, or to acquire. It's not part of the free gift, but the opportunity is. You see it? That you might gain it. If you want to know why are you here in time, there's a good one, that you might gain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. By sanctification, being a set apart from him, requiring that you stand fast in the word, verse 15, see what he says. So then, brethren, because this is God's goal, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Of course, at the time frame, the, the apostles were there and they were teaching. You now have it all down and written. Gaining that glory is conditional and it is eternal. That has nothing to do with the resurrection. Every believer, well, I can be corrected. Every believer is going to be resurrected. Every believer is going to have a resurrected body. Every believer is going to have an immortal body. Every believer participates in that. But glorification is not something every believer has. And that is radically, that is not radically different, but that's different than the way I have understood it before, I'll be honest. So what is the glory of the Lord Christ that we can gain? See you in two weeks. Um, whoever, whoever is cleaning up the church afterward, be sure and sweep up the bird seat. But understand this. For me, this has also been a journey. Because where we're going is this. The three phases, I'll go ahead and give you a hint here. The three phases of the Lord's glorification included a fully glorified body. Second, his glorification of honor when he went home. And third, the coming in the millennial kingdom is the king high priest. Every believer will, who is an overcomer will be part of two and three. But not all believers, we already know that, don't we? Not all believers are going to be honored at the judgment seat of Christ. So we can share his glory at that level. Third, not all believers are going to rule and reign with Christ. We already know that, don't we? Nod your head up and down. That means to share his glory includes that. But what about the glorified body? Is that for everybody? The glorified body is a sharing of his glory where the believer shines. They will have the power to rule and reign with him. Not all believers will have that. Those that don't, will not be living in the new Jerusalem. They will not shine as stars. They have an immortal body. They will live forever. It is without pain and suffering and all those other things, but they will not have the privilege of that rulership, that ownership, and they will not shine like stars. And that's significant. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration? That was a picture. He was showing his divine glory. 
But in, in Revelation 1, we see his glory as the glorified man, literally shining so bright it was like the sun. That's the full glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's sharing in that that he wants to share with us. And we can earn it. We can earn it. That's where we're going, but you'll have to come back for the details in two weeks. All right. We love you, church. I really do. You know how this, I've been working on this for months, and it's important. Let's go to the Lord in prayer uh, to close out. Now, Father, I thank you for this time around your word. May these truths sink into our hearts and may you be glorified through it all. And Lord, I pray that all of us will gain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in its fullness, that we will have that fullness, abundance, that weight of glory, that our life and time will work out for us when we listen to your word, when we respond to it, when we strive toward it, when we fail we confess, we get up, we go and keep working, knowing that our work for the Lord is not in vain. For it's in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I commend you now to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Set your mind on things above and not on the things of this earth, for you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and peace be with you. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity and all God's people said, amen. amen. Just before we have prayer, what a song are we singing? I forgot. 419, family of God. All right, 419, stand up, family of God, if you need it. And this God go close us. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God.